Okay, so GYN procedures and vaginal hysterectomy. So for our indications, total vaginal hysterectomy, so that's TVH, is a good operation. It's not done all that commonly. I only saw it a couple times on my rotation. That's mainly because laparoscopic procedures have become a lot more common. Um, and when you do a TVH, you lose some of the standard benefits that come with doing things laparoscopically. And the main ones are less uh, time in the hospital after the operation and also less pain. Um, and, but versus a total abdominal hysterectomy, TVH, uh, total vaginal hysterectomy, is recommended because TVH has been shown to have less um, infections and also less pain than total abdominal hysterectomy. So some of the contraindications when you wouldn't want to do this are with cancer, mainly because you can't um, explore the abdomen at all and see what's going on, and then also size of the uterus. So if you have a really big uterus, you might have a problem delivering it through the vagina. And you also might have problems because you're you're working sort of along the side of the uterus trying to access, for example, the uterine artery and the cardinal ligament off to the side of the uterus, and that might be difficult uh, just space-wise if the uterus is really big. And the indications, these are the same um, as in general for hysterectomy, so a lyomyoma, what would be alternatives to hysterectomy for that? I can think of two different ones. So one of them would be myomectomy, and the other one would be uterine artery embolization. So pelvic organ prolapse, you could try a pessary or pelvic force strengthening exercises. For pain, let's say you have pain caused by something specific like endometriosis, what's medical therapy for that? GnRH analogs, you could use those. And if you have abnormal bleeding, you might want to try ablation of the endometrial lining before you proceed to something like hysterectomy. So for the anatomy review, we have the peritoneum coming down, sort of draping over the uterus, extending out towards us, for, forming the broad ligament to the lateral wall, reflecting up anteriorly onto the bladder, forming the vesico-uterine fold here. This is anterior cul-de-sac and then the posterior cul-de-sac back here. And then you get the bladder anteriorly, rectum posteriorly. Here's the vaginal opening coming to the cervix and then uterus. So you might have to do a, um, a bimanual exam before the operation. And if you do, you're going to want to report something when you're done with it so you don't just you know, stand there with nothing to say. And what, you, what you're going to want to say is the what you think the version and the flexion is, which are terms to describe the position of the uterus. Um, here in the in the pelvis in the pelvis. So the version is the angle of the uterus with respect to the vaginal opening. So the way I've drawn it drawn it here, if you're pushing up on the cervix and you're feeling the abdomen with your other hand, and you can feel the uterus um, bumping up against your hand, then it's probably antiverted, which is the way it's shown. If you can't feel anything then it might be retroverted like this. And so then you wouldn't be able to feel it when you're pushing. So that's version, the uterus with respect to the vaginal opening. And then you have flexion which is the uterus with respect to the cervix. So let's say we're going up here like this, like we're antiverted, but then we branch off this way. That would be antiverted and antiflexed. So continuing along with the anatomy review, we have the um, arterial supply. So we have abdominal aorta dividing up into common iliacs. And then we have the common iliacs further dividing into the external and the internal. And so the external, what does that become after the inguinal ligament? That becomes the femoral, and the internal divides up into anterior and, and posterior divisions. Then we'll put the uterus in just to get oriented. And the, off of the anterior division of the internal iliac, we have what matters to us, which is the uterine artery. There's also the vaginal artery, um, the umbilical artery, and some other um, important ones that come off of this division of the internal iliac. So the ureter, where does that go? So that's coming down from the, the kidney up here. It crosses on top of the um, common iliacs just before just before it bifurcates into the internal and external divisions, and then comes down, runs almost alongside the uterine artery, and then passes underneath the uterine artery. So that's where the water under the bridge comes from. And just for general knowledge, where does this division happen? Where does the um, the abdominal aorta divide up into the common into the common iliacs? That's at the navel. So that's T10 at your belly, butt 10. And lymphatics and embryology. So you have the uterus and part of the vagina. Where does that come from, em embryology-wise? Those are malarian structures, and the lymphatics that serve them are the internal and external nodes, and ultimately the common iliac nodes up here. And so you have the distal vagina. Where does that come from, embryology-wise? That's from the urogenital sinus, and that goes over here to the inguinal nodes, and the inguinal nodes are over by the femoral artery, which is near the inguinal ligament. And the last layer of anatomy to add is the is the, the the ligaments. That's the important thing I want to put in here. So you have the blood supply to the ovary. So that's coming to right off the abdominal aorta, and that travels in a ligament called the suspensory ligament of the ovary. And that's the way it was in years um, one and two of school. But then um, on the rotation, 
that became the infundibulo pelvic ligament. So if you hear people talking about the IP, that's what they're talking about. That's the suspensory ligament of the ovary that's bringing the blood to the ovaries. Then you have the uterine artery. What does that run in? That runs in the cardinal ligament coming up from the lateral wall to the uterus. And then you have the uterosacral um, ligament. And that sort of meets up with the cardinal ligament forming the uterosacral um, cardinal complex attaching here to the uterus. But the uterosacral, where does it where does it come from or where does it go, depending on how you're looking at it? And then it goes posterior and inferior to the ischial spine and the sacrum. So that's sort of providing anterior posterior support, whereas the cardinal is providing more lateral support. And you have the round ligament here. What what travels in the round ligament? It's like a pimp question type of thing. That's um, Samson's artery. It goes in there. And so where's that headed to? That's headed to the labia majora. And then where where does it travel in important places? The internal ring of the of the inguinal canal. So the only other ligament to add is the is an easy one because the way it's named is the utero ovarian ligament. So that uh, finishes off the anatomy review. So now move on to the procedure. So pre-op, your standard um, sort of setup: cephalosporins. Get them in a half an hour before. If somebody has asymptomatic bacterial vaginosis, you have to treat it, which means um, you have to test for it because you treat it even if it is asymptomatic, and you use Metro to treat it. And along with that, you get the disulfiram reaction, headache, metallic taste. NG tube, so that's important to keep air out of the um, intestines, which helps prevent um, injury to the bowels. Foley, we didn't, I didn't see those used. Um, I think it's plus or minus on those. Cancer screening, you want to do this for everybody with hysterectomy, so you want to make sure they've had a pap smear recently in the last couple, in the couple months leading up to the procedure, and if it's age appropriate, greater than 40 or 45, depending on the guidelines, mammography, um, endometrial cancer, let's say you're worried about that, there's some abnormal uterine bleeding or something, you'd want to investigate that with the DNC and directed biopsy of the endometrial lining. And DVT prophylaxis, so the standard setup, the heparin and the PCD boots, and then the patient's supine and stirrups, and you're ready to get going with the procedure. So the, the general idea is for this, because there's there's lots of different ways to do it, and everyone will do it differently, but just, and it's important to know the general idea. So you want to get inside of the peritoneum, and you have to go do that by getting access anteriorly, so that's between the vesico-uterine fold, and then posteriorly, that's getting into the posterior cul-de-sac. Then you want to free up the uterus from its attachment uh, from its attachments to the peritoneum, like the broad ligament, and also disconnect it from its blood supply, so that'd be the uterine artery, and then um, the utero-ovarian or, or IP ligament, depending on what you're doing with the upper vascular pedicles. And then you can keep or remove the ovaries, and then you want to re-peritonealize and create a vaginal cuff. So now we'll go through step by step just to get a little bit more detail and, and sort of show an example. So the first thing is positioning the patient. So they're in dor dorsal lithotomy position, so like this. And so about with what goes along with that is um, you're you're flexing the hip. And so what damage could that could that cause, or what what thing what adverse event could that cause? It could compress the femoral nerves, specifically the femoral cutaneous um, nerve L2 L3, which could cause anesthesia to the anterior part of the thigh after the procedure and then so at the knee what what damage or patient positioning issue could, could come up with there um, there could be compression of the, the perineal nerve there okay so that's that and then when you start out you might um, inject vasopressin into the cervix and that's to prevent bleeding so remember vasopressin that's ADH ADH the, the V2 receptors helping put the aquaporins into the um, collecting tubules uh, and then also at high concentrations is what you use here, so that's why it's called vasopress and press in those vessels to prevent bleeding. All right, so in terms of the actual procedure, the first thing you, that, you, that you might do is incise around the, um, the cervix here at the, sort of the junction of the cervix and the vagina, and then you want to gain anterior access. So you have to dissect away between the, uh, the bladder and the, and the uterus until you get to the vesicouterine fold, and we'll go back up here to look at this picture to, to get an idea about that. So you're working here, you're dissecting away here, working your way up to the vesicouterine fold. You'll probably use a retractor, like a right angle retractor, to pull up on the bladder um, to sort of get it out of the way. And then you, when you find the vesicouterine fold, it'll be like a little um, white line. You can pick it up with uh, with pickups and then size it with Mayo scissors, and then you've gained access to the to the anterior cul-de-sac. So you've made a hole in the anterior peritoneum, and then you can turn your attention to the posterior side. And luckily, the posterior um, peritoneum is actually really close. You can see right here where you are, sort of the junction of the cervix and the vagina, the posterior peritoneum is close there, so you just incise that. And so now you've gained access anteriorly and posteriorly inside of the peritoneum. 
So you've done that, so you can, now you can start to work on disconnecting the uterus from um, the ligaments in this blood supply. So the first thing will be you want to take a bite of the uterosacral ligament, and so you can use heaney clamps to grab it, and you want to grab, um, you want to stay real close to the uterus, so you gra grab real close, cut, take a bite, and then you're moving up. So what's the next thing you're going to run into? The next thing will be the cardinal ligaments, so you can um, bite those, um, clamp them, cut them, make vascular pedicles out of those, keep working your way up the broad ligament, and now you've sort of loosened up the, the uterus from a lot of its attachments, and you can walk its way out a little bit. Um, and you have to, and then once so once you've done that, I'll just put put on what we've done to summarize. So, uterus sacral, we dealt with that. Cardinals, we made that vascular pedal. We've worked pedicle. We've worked our way up here along the broad. And so now, depending on um, what's going on with the ovaries, we can decide what to do next. And so I'll put in the utero ovarian here. So let's say we're going to um, take the ovaries, keep the ovaries inside. So then we could cut the round. And utero ovarian, and then we could remove we could remove remove the uterus. So we're grabbing the uterus here. We're pulling it out of the of the hole we've created in, um, by slicing around the cervix. And let's say that we're gonna um, um, take the ovaries with us instead. What would we do there? Well, we could start by doing the same thing. We could cut the round utero ovarian. We could tag the utero ovarian with um, some suture. So we remove the cervix to get it out of the way, and then we grab the the tag that we put in here in this ligament, and pull on it put some tension on it and help us identify um, infundibulopelvic. And remember, the infundibulopelvic is the suspensory ligament of the ovary bringing the blood to the ovaries. We want to find that, and then we want to um, cut that, and then we can remove the ovary. So now what's left is reperitonealization and uh, making the vaginal cuff. So reperitonealization, that's putting the, putting the peritoneum back together. So we we cut the peritoneum anterior at the vesicouterine fold posteriorly, and then also as we worked our way up, we um, took different bites out. For example, this might be the uterus sacral ligament, part of the broad ligament. Maybe this is tubo ovarian ligament. So when you reperitonealize, you um, take a needle and suture and you sew these back together to bring them, um, bring them back together with each other. And so that's shown over here. Now they're now they're close together. And you do that to to recreate the the structure and support that the peritoneum um, provides in the pelvis. And then so once you do that, then you want to make the on the vaginal cuff, and again, you have suture in your string. You're closing off the vaginal cuff, and you can get little bites of, for example, let's say this is uterosacral ligament. You can get bites of that um, as you're, as you're working, and that'll help pr um, provide some structure and su and support to prevent complications. For example, things like enteroseal. So that's why you want to. Um, that's why they take the time to, um, to do all this uh, suturing. All right. So complications. So we have the the standard complications that come along with um, doing hysterectomy, fever, hemorrhage, um, injury to the um, bladder or ureter, although we noted that this is, at least a study showed this to be less common, um, doing it vaginally than laparoscopically, bowel injury, cuff dehiscence, so that's the cuff that we just talked about sewing closed. If that doesn't um, sew close all the way or if it um, comes open and some, some bowel goes through it and, and his blood supply gets cut off and gets strangulated, that's um, vaginal cuff, to cuff dehiscence with potentially evisceration, which would be sort of a serious, rare, um, but unique complication of this type of operation. And the cuff can also get infected. So then you have the uh, general surgical complications, MI, stroke, renal failure, and then common sense things like you want to avoid vaginal inter intercourse for um, some time after this procedure. So the post-op, you have this, the, the standard setup. Um, don't need antibiotics after day one. Keep the, you can put, you put a Foley in sort of after you do this procedure if you didn't have one in during it. Um, you get some fluids, DVT prophylaxis till the person's walking around. You can air ambulate them day one post-op, get people walking around, and you advance the diet from water to clear liquids to regular depending on flatus, appetite, and bowel sounds. And so questions, things that um, I got asked during this procedure, so um, what space are we entering? So that's in the beginning of the procedure. So if you're below the cervix, you're probably entering the posterior cul-de-sac. If, if you're above the cervix, then you can say, I think we're entering um, the anterior cul-de-sac going through the vesicouterine fold. So why do you have to clamp and cut the ligaments and vessels um, right next to the uterus? You do that because you want to avoid injury, injury to the ureter. So unlike doing this laparoscopically or abdominally, you can't um, really see what's going on as well. So you can't identify the ureter, watch it peristalsis, and then, and then cut. So you just want to um, avoid injury by keeping a close eye on where you're working. 
And then questions that you could ask, you could ask if they notice a difference in complications. Do they think that, for example, there's less um, injury to the ureter by doing this? And also you could say, what makes you select um, vaginal versus laparoscopic? Why, why are we doing this vaginally? Things that could favor a vaginal approach would be um, someone who's um, has had multiple children, um, someone who has a uterus that's small. Um, those are things that might fav favor a vaginal approach. And then laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy. I didn't see those. You could ask um, if, if they do those frequently um, and what sort of indications would, would make them want to do that. And you could bring up things like if, it, if you, you're having trouble with getting the ovary out or, or accessing the infundibular pelvic ligament, would you would you want to do? Um, would you want to add laparoscopic assistance to the procedure to help make that happen? Okay, so that's our summary of vaginal hysterectomy.